So I'm going to skip up now from the New Testament to Aquinas, very briefly pointing out that there, there is a tradition of thinking right through that period from the New Testament to Aquinas. Uh, I mentioned the patriarchal tradition in the Old Testament. The period from the New Testament to about 800 is called the period of the fathers of the church. But I needn't comment on that. Still, the struggle of these men, and if you think of the, say, the influence of the Gregory of Nyssa and his brother, the influence of mother and sister, you, you find that it's, it's not just the fathers of the church. The struggle was towards some understanding of the divinity uh, which liberated the word father, say, in the New Testament from uh, sexuality. Uh, there was a discovery of limitless understanding. God is spirit and is to be worshipped in spirit and truth. Uh, so the divinity as, um, as emerging in the understanding of the tradition was a divinity that was spirit, a spirit that was understanding. I'm not talking about the practice of the church, but the searching of the contemplatives, uh, a search that was called theoria, theory, and I mentioned earlier that theory in the good sense meant this, and it springs from this, scientific in the sense that isn't in the dictionary I talked about the last two days, scientific as a collection of data. No, it's scientific in, uh, in understanding, searching for understanding. Okay. So through these men, Augustine is a dominant person around the year 400. Uh, one of the people not in that tradition is a, a Roman Boethius, died around 530. Uh, he picked up on a lot of Aristotle, including a very important part of Aristotle, where Aristotle figures out that this divinity does not have foreknowledge not because the divinity does not understand everything, but because there is no before. Now that is a huge question in some of my other classes. We spend days working on that. Uh, does God know now that I'm going to eat pizza at 9.30? And the answer is no. Not because God doesn't know everything, but because God doesn't know beforehand. There isn't any beforehand. That's a very tricky problem. You'll find in St. Paul that he can't figure that out in his letter to the Romans. You'll find in St. Augustine that he mucks around with that problem and he says, well, this is a mystery. I can't figure out. We are free and yet God has foreknowledge and predestination. Now that takes a lot of figuring out. And 10 years if you take it leisurely and if you work hard at it, 20. Okay. So uh, that was added in from Aristotle into the tradition that arrived at Aquinas's, let's say, doorstep. Aquinas had the advantage of a very good teacher, uh, a fellow called Albert called the great even in his own lifetime. Born in 1206, and he outlived Thomas by four years. Thomas was born in 1225, and he died on March the 7th, 1274. And the condemnation I mentioned at the end of the last session was March the 7th, 1277. I always like to think of that as a sort of a cynical move. Well, he's dead three years, let's condemn him. Condemnation was, was much wider than that, but he fell under this condemnation. And Thomas, at that period, was writing his textbook for 
slow students called his Summa Theologica. He wrote it, began it in a place called Sancta Sabina in Rome. I, I, I sometimes think, but uh, I haven't followed this up, he wasn't in Paris, he wasn't in a big university, he was in a little uh, studium, a, a place for the studies of clerics. I, I, I fancy that he was squeezed out of the institution, but I like to think it, perhaps. Anyway, he decided at, at some stage uh, in the 1260s that he'd write a little textbook, and he wrote this book, which he never finished, the Summa, a collection, Theologica, Perhaps I should have brought in a, a copy of it. It probably runs to about 5,000 pages. It depends on what sort of edition you have. And it has first part, a second part with the first part, so prima secunde, first part and second part. The second part of the second part, secunda secunde, and then a third part. And the first part begins talking about God, question 1 to 26. God as one. And question 27, he starts talking about God as three. And in the third part, he starts talking about the Incarnation, some remarkable stuff. I was reading about Carl Jung today, and he remarked once that he, he had a shot at reading Thomas Aquinas, and he couldn't make head or tail of it. Why? Because to make head or tail of Thomas Aquinas, you've got to find out these elements. Lonergan mentions in his work on Aquinas that unless you discover yourself, you can no more talk about the Trinity or God than a blind man can talk about colors. And that's the difficulty. Now, I don't want to go into Carl Jung's problem there, but it's a, a general problem of the intellectual tradition that comes out of this influence. That self-attention is almost impossible, discovering what I do when I mind. But that was the basis of Thomas's effort, and he picked up the clues from Aristotle. How do I know this, he says, in the first part of the Summa, question 87, article 4. Well, I tried it myself. How do you understand? You need to mess around to get an insight. OK, so in the first part of the Summa, he picks up on the stuff from Aristotle. It's, it's quite marvelous to see the history of Aristotle's translations through Arabic to the Arabs and the Jews, the Spaniards, the Italians, and eventually into Latin. And it's available to Thomas. And uh, he is moving at a shocking rate of understanding. Uh, it, it, it's a shocking book to read if you're serious. God as one, the, the dominant notion is that, yes, it's limitless understanding. And I mentioned earlier the manner in which you can connect question three, article two, or yes, uh, or two, article three, with the five whys, the five levels, the five ways to reach God by reflecting on oneself. But in this section, he spells out the notion of limitless understanding that is provident, caring, not foreknowing in any sense of beforehand, but understanding. And I won't get into the question of creation, which is dealt with later, but I can okay mention that the, the notion of the divinity creating is that the divinity creates now and we create with the divinity. It's a co-creation. There isn't a divine plan laid out that you have to hunt for. There's a way in which you can be taught to pray that you know the will of God, and it's a cop-out. The, the divine invitation is that you have intelligence, 
a new plan, and between you and God, you can make the universe. Or as I mentioned in chapter 5, and it connects with the topic of mystery, you can write the great nocturne, of which we have only a first few chords. It's quite a different notion of history. We're just about down from the trees after the first million or so years. And after the next million years, we won't have to talk about this. It will be taken for granted. Isn't that optimism? Second million years is on our side. Okay, so th that's all in this section of the Summa, the infinite understanding of the divinity. And then he swings into th this marvelous question 27, and he says, suppose that there are, for translating, intelligible emanations in God. Now, what's he trying to do? He's trying to figure out some way of understanding this. What, what, what can this mean? Can I get any glimpse of this? And he picks up clues from Aristotle, from Augustine, from St. John. Uh, and it's important to notice that, that Thomas was reading the scriptures endlessly. And it's in the scriptures, it, when he takes up St. John, and I'm not going to try and track back where St. John got this language, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. I would note, though, that in the New Testament, the notion of beforehand, it's dominant. St. John would write, the Word was with God. Thomas might write, the Word is with God. You can't talk about God in the past tense. But he picked up on all these clues, and especially in reading St. John, he asked, well, what can be meant by this word? And he goes back to his work. I mentioned this article already, question, uh, question 84, article 7, that sort of his discussion of human nature in this section. And he says, well, how about us? And he raises the very interesting question, commenting on the first verse of St. John's Gospel, what, what is the inner word of a stone? How do you get it? What's the concept of a stone? This is quite remarkable for somebody in the 13th century. What's the chemistry of a certain type of stone? Well, he says, I, I don't know, but I know it would take an awful lot of work really remarkable. And what's he talking about? He's talking about puzzling around. He has read Aristotle. Albert is the great botanist of the time. He knows what it is to try and figure out something. And that if you figure out something, and this is the key thing in Aquinas, if you figure out something, you have this jump. You have an insight. And again, that's, I appeal back to the work we did on the puzzle. You had the experience. Some of you phoned me up. Some of you mentioned that you were up late at night, that you were annoying your teacher friends, and so on, etc. But yeah, and it comes eventually if you take time. There's an insight, and then yeah, I can talk, but I can talk inwardly first. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Now, when you've got it, you may not have it all sorted out. And you'll find that out if you turn to a friend and say, I, I've got that puzzle. And they say, well, what's the answer? Well, I haven't got it that far. Have any of you got a puzzle that far? I, I've nearly got it. Well, well, tell me, well, I can't. Because you haven't expressed it inwardly, you're not in control. I talked about the coach. You can think of, say, the great conductor. Great conduct Nadia Boulanger I talked about before, the first woman to conduct the various big symphony orchestras in the late 30s. Uh, she, she conducts brilliantly because she has an inner word. She's got the whole thing together. And this will be important when we, we talk about the knowledge of Jesus, the mind of Christ. But the focus of attention is on this activity of doing puzzles. And when you 
breakthrough, you have a leap of understanding, and it produces the inner word, whether it's the what, or the is, the nod, yeah, or the menu, the plan, the project, or the evaluation. This is the way to go. But I in each case, you notice that sequence. There's a leap. And let's, let's take the menu, the project, as, as a key one. That's the what to do question. There's a leap, and then there's an inner word. And Thomas, following Augustine, took this as a clue, and indeed the only clue, that will give you some light on this. And it's a terrific leap. OK, and let's see, can we at least give leads to this? This, this again, I, I'm amused when I have these flashbacks to previous teaching when I I had a whole course to talk about this, five hours a week for one year. Uh, OK, so what can I do? I can give you a few leads. Lead kindly light, as that hymn I, I quoted a few weeks ago. <laughs> Amidst the encircling gloom, one step enough for me. I think that should be the hymn of the course. If the feminists don't object, <laughs> we call it a horror. OK. So there is, let's say, I draw a circle. It doesn't matter what I draw. There is a, a thing called limitless understanding. OK. And that is the divinity of Aristotle. Infinite in understanding symbolized, well, it's a very silly symbol, but Marks on a board can help by a circle. And, and it, it's a, a reasonable symbol that, that it dominated the, the West for so long, the, the perfection of the circle and so on. OK, infinite understanding. And you have this problem then that, well, it's not one. And how can you think of that? And can you think of three? People having a common understanding, no, that's not good enough. And uh, what I, I would love to do, if we had time, would be to take up some of the very serious people in this period who spent weeks and months and years. I'm thinking of one of my favorite fathers of the church, Greg, <laughs> Gregory of Nyssa. one of the brothers I talked about earlier. And he wrote a letter to a, f a colleague, Ablabius, are there three gods? And he puzzled about, well, Peter, Paul, and John, are there three men? And uh, How are three men possible? Are they all men? Uh, it's quite a puzzle. Uh, one nature and a lot of persons. But here we have the oneness of either the Greek divinity of Aristotle, Plato, or of the Old Testament divinity. You, you don't want to give up on that. And Thomas got the clue from yeah, the, the nature of this inner leap, insight. This does not occur in God. There isn't any puzzling. There's the excitement of insight, an eternal uh, bliss of total understanding, uh, inexhaustible delight, which drives, there's a certain sense in which you would say, eternally drives the divinity crazy. So that within the infinite understanding, there is The word here is, let there be an intelligible emanation. But let's think of it in metaphor, which has a basis in our experience. There's a something, let's call it a wow, in the divinity. 
And if there's a wow, there's a speak. All right, let me put in speaker. Well, it, it, for a start, you might think, well, if there's a wow, there's a speak. And it, it's a wow of excitement. And where do you get a notion of this? In the excitement of, I've got it, and yeah, and I've got it all together. It's not just a bright idea of a good dinner, it's, yeah. Now, notice this. Let's say we, we work up to this level. Yeah? Am I to do it? And, and think of, I hope you've had this experience of, yeah, you really wanted to have a nice dinner, and you, you settle down, and you think it out, and you plan the menu, and you think of the guests, and you think of the musical arrangements, you think of which type of smell to have, which sort of music, what sort of cheese to end up with, the liqueur, and so on, yeah? And you reach, uh, many of you can recall this in your experience, you reach that moment of a judgment of value, yeah, I'm going to do it, and yeah. And you haven't done a damn thing about cooking it. Huh? There's, okay, you get to this stage, if you like, the 13, the judgment of the value of deciding. Yeah? And there's a response in you of decision. And as I said last week, I'm not going to get into an analysis of all this. We're doing enough as it is. There's a response of acceptance. OK. Now, I'll refer you back to Wealth Chapter 6 acceptance called serenity. Yeah. It's as if inside yourself your response without any words is saying, that's a damn fine plan. Okay? So you have the wow, the word, the project, and it's very acceptable. So you have not only a speak, you have a listen. No. And this is St. Thomas trying to figure out, is there any way of thinking of three in one? And as far as he can see, this is the only way. And Lonergan, his later work, will point out that as far as he can see, there is no other way want to get a, a, a notion of the Trinity that is of understanding, you can get a notion of understanding anywhere else than in understanding. That seems to be very straightforward. Yeah. You get the notion from understanding. Where then can you get three in? You get three in because we actually do something like this. There is that leap in us of expression and acceptance, happiness. Um, pushing it on a little bit, I like to give questions that one can entertain regularly over decades. These questions occurred to me when I was preparing a homily, a sermon, once way back, heavens above, in the late 60s. But they seem to bring out uh, the challenge of thinking about this. There are questions about conversation. Four questions about conversation. First question, when did you last have a real conversation? And I say last and I say real. You've got to think of a particular conversation. And it may be a very gloomy question. Well, the last time I saw my shrink, very lucky, who's your shrink? A real conversation. When did you last have a real conversation? What happens? Within a real conversation, there is understanding, understanding and understood. And we can go back to Poldy and Molly, Jack and Jill, 
Uncle Chang and Grandma Moses, all our illustrations. Emma Bovary and Charles Bovary, the non-conversation. You can bring out the notion of real conversation from non-conversation. Conversation I brought out by examining this. I don't quite see what you mean. Uh, a real conversation requires an ambience of understanding. A presence of understanding, understood, a meshing. So the second question, when, when were you last understanding, understood? A heavy foot follow up to the question of conversation. And the third question brings you into this context of Thomas. When did you last speak? I've quoted regularly Paul Simon's song, people talking without speaking, hearing without listening. Talk, however learned. Speaking, but when you actually come forth out of yourself. It may not be language, it may be gesture. It's a farewell at an airport, a wave of the hand, uh, a hug. And when you're speaking, there's, a, there's an expression, and it may be inner. Sometimes the, 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 the very possibility of outer words is destructive. A tear. Speak, insofar as you speak, there is an inner wow of delight or pain. And insofar as you reflect on that speaking, day by day, that question of speaking, and think it out personally, you find that you get some image of what goes on eternally in the divinity. When we speak, whether a word or a tear, it, it's not all of us. We make little gestures. Even if it's the project of oneself, it's still only a little bit of oneself. But in the divinity, the speech is a speech of infinite understanding in a state of infinite joy, beauty, love, any word that will help, speaking out all of self in a word that is a second self. And now you can get some notion of identity, get some meaning into the word consubstantial, so that's the third question. When did you last speak? And so far as you think about that, you can think of speaker and word. And the word is such that it's identical with the speaker, echoing the infinite understanding. And that word is such that it calls forth a listening, a listener. So the fourth question is, when did you last listen? And it's a terrific question, people hearing without listening. Yeah. <laughs> Again, our little exercise is a help. Didn't quite see what you mean. And again, refer back to our discussion of experiences of not being listened to. You're in a state of high happiness or utter depression, and you go to what you thought was a friend. And the friend says, oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was like that last week. So when did you last listen? Where listening means that you are alert, you're open, your, your toes are alert. You're listening in serenity or in concern with a huge human openness. We talked about being attentive last week. I, I remarked on the difficulty of attending, say, to a, a very artistic friend. Again, on page 172, I mentioned Merce Cunningham, the, the, the very eccentric dancer. And he remarked in an interview, every day I start afresh. And if you've seen him dance, it's quite remarkable. I mentioned Twilight Tarp, fresh starts all the time. And do we start afresh to listen? No, it's the same old person that you met. No, real listening is when the listening is, oh, this is fresh. 
So the fourth question is a horrific personal question about self-discovery. And you can discover that you're a pathetic human being. You've got to relax about that and have a sense of humor. So th this is a hint to what Thomas worked out personally in, in the Summa, question 27 on. Suppose, yeah, would this help? And it helped Thomas, and it's a powerful invitation to, to get a notion of the Christian divinity and notice it's not patriarchal. The speaker, the word, the listener, not a patriarchal divinity. In the tradition, because of the patriarchal background and because of the structure of the incarnation, the speaker is identified as father. Now, when we will progress, I don't know what the progression of language in the Christian tradition is. Uh, our speaker who art in heaven. These are tricky problems of shifts in culture. But one shift that is not legitimate is a tendency that is in some feminist writers to say, well, let's call the first person our creator. No, 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 no. The divinity is, is the creator. These create. So it's just a very simple theological slip. OK, that, that then gives you some notion of Thomas trying to think out the Trinity. From it flows an enormous, enriching way of praying, thinking, history. I'll just enlarge a slight bit on the history feature because of our line. I mentioned that uh, I was going to get back to that line. And again, what am I doing here? I'm just giving clues for later reflection. Uh, if this was a serious, say, theological course, well then, there would be several years afterwards to follow this up. But you're on your own. Okay, let's go back to our line. On page 203 of Process, and this is the arbitrary date again, minus 1000 BC, plus 2500 AD, And you have here in the diagram the incarnation. And I think I have IP2, the incarnation of the second person. OK, so you've got P1, P2, and P3. And you find, instead of the traditional notions, you have the speaker, identified in the New Testament as, as the Father, the word, second person, incarnate, and the listener, identified as the spirit, spirit of serenity and concern, fits in with a lot of the New Testament literature. Okay, now, there is a problem. There is the, well, let's metaphorically talk about it as a problem. The divinity has a problem, eternally. And the divinity has solved this problem, eternity, uh, eternally. And what is the problem? The problem is, and again, I use uh, uh, unconventional and maybe offensive language, the divinity is having a hell of a party. These three persons are eternally in intimate conversation, wowing it up, okay? And again, you, you think of your analogy of, suppose you're having this great conversation. Suppose there's more than two of you. And many of you have, say, spontaneously started a party and let's phone up. Yeah. Things are starting to move. Uh, do, do you have parties like that in Canada? <laughs> I was at an event last night at the university, and 
It was so quiet when I came in. I said, this isn't a door like an Irish wake. <laughs> OK, so the divinity is having this infinite understanding togetherness and bursting with the possibility of sharing. Not, not necessarily. This is infinite benevolence. How do you do it? Now, I'm not going to go into Thomas's summa. <laughs> We're doing the whole summa tonight on the question of the angels and so on. But certainly, we're here, and what are we? We're, we are the lowest possible intelligence. I was going to say imaginable. Uh, I heard a person remark once that Lonergan had made the remark that man is the most improbable of creatures. Corresponding to the infinite understanding shared by these three, you have the infinite absence of understanding that is the human water. Some of the philosophers after 1277 talk about the tabula rasa, that we, we are a blank slate. It's a borrowed from Aristotle, but badly mistreated. No, we are not a blank slate. We are an empty desire. The Emma I talked about earlier, with what? We are water. Uh, and the what is empty. It's an infinite loneliness. Uh, and that infinite loneliness is an infinite loneliness, a want of this party. Now, the dynamics of human history within this theology would suggest that how do you invite? You invite by somehow boosting the listening possibility. I'm not going to get into this because it, it's a huge but very rich topic. The, the, the presence of the supernatural in history m might be identified as somehow a presence, not an activity. The activity is always personal, a presence of listening if you like the help of the spirit we are not alone there's a listening lift the spirit incognito in the pre-Christian tradition backing up Aristotle Socrates, the Hindus so on and the Old Testament The spirit breathing over the water. Now, I'm not, I'm not connecting that with the third person of the Trinity. I do not think there is a Trinitarian theology within the Old Testament in, in explicit, written by these chaps. It's quite another thing when you take it in a larger context as, say, we, when we discussed malaria. Okay, there's a listening potential opening up the human group, whether the Greek, the Hebrew, the Hindu, globally. One can find a, a great transition in the 6th century BC, right across the, the globe, the Hawaiian Ho Basin and so on. Literacy. The fullness of time. What was the fullness of time? Not the fullness. Well, we had got to literacy and we can count to three. The fullness of time is a beginning. Go back to my song at the beginning, spring another notion of history as, yeah, it, the fullness of time, well, we could write and we could count, and then one turned up. Was it the best of time? It was convenient. There's a question of convenience dominating Thomas's discussion of uh, all of this. When you get to the third part, I think it's question three, article seven, Thomas starts discussing, well, what might the divinity have done? And it's terrific stuff. And no wonder he was condemned. Yet could three persons take the one nature? Oh, yeah. Could one person take two natures? Oh, yeah. And one suggestion here, and I, I hope the Pope hears me. I need a condemnation. Uh, one suggestion here is, yeah, the first coming of the second person was as a male because... There was no way God could have become a woman in that situation. 
Now, what about the second coming of the second person? According to Thomas's article here, there's nothing to prevent the second person turning up as a woman. And you can examine the New Testament, etc., and see who is the I that talks about returning? And is it the second person? And which nature is involved? It's, it's, it's fascinating to think this out. I like imagining, as last week I talked about the man with the sword in the Bronze Age saying this could fly. So can you imagine the, the second person turning up, well, say, next week in the Vatican? My God, without a bra? Okay, so uh, one has to see that yeah, this, this man is trying to think out possibilities. What could God do? God could be a lot of human nature. But in this situation, the patriarchal tradition of the Hebrews, of the Romans, the Greeks, uh, the incarnation was a man and uh, giving rise to these problems. Now, the further problems. That's Thomas on the Trinity, the second person becoming man. Following through Thomas in this third part, we get back to the question I raised in the second lecture. mind and minding and the mind of Christ. And it's a slogan out of the scriptures. Let that mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And I suggested that certainly if one is mildly intelligent, one should notice that the question comes up, well, what's a mind? Hmm? And at least we've named the answer, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. What was the mind of Christ? And I'm still talking about Thomas Aquinas. And this little book he never finished. Like to us in all things. Okay. Jesus had a mind, which means he had sensibility. Okay? And he had the other 12 elements, and 13 plus. And, again, back to our exercise with the, the Bible, or, or in chapter 5 of Process, I, I select pieces out of St. John, uh, you'll find that the talker has questions. Whom do men say that I am? So on. Statements. Flesh and blood hath not revealed to you. Are you going up to Jerusalem? No. Okay. So you find that Jesus grows, normal human being, normal human nature, not a normal human being. A person in two natures, let, let's get a handy diagram. It's always good to have a handy diagram. You have this, I, I call this the elbow bone diagram. It's just a convenience, but this is difficult stuff. It's helpful to have a diagram. All right. So you have a person sharing a divine nature with P1 and P3. And that person has a human nature. And earlier I talked about this group being understanding. 
Okay, now we're getting to the notion that yes, there's a human understanding. That emerged as part of the Christian group's thinking in the Council of Constantinople in 681. Christ had a human intelligence, human will, and grew in wisdom, age, and grace. Okay. Had insights. Learned how to work with wood, carry water. Okay, there, there's a problem here. And again, I, I can only hint at our, my discussion in chapter 5 of process. Did this chap, that's the word I used through the chapter, it's a very handy word. It keeps me away from all the trouble of debates of what to name this person. Did this chap know who he was? It seems an important question. If he didn't know who he was, he's not worth following, right? for starters. Yeah? Now, if he knew who he was, let's go back to our definition, or my definition and your words, your little definition maybe at this stage. Knowledge is correctly understanding experience. Now, nominal knowledge, naming, well, we can name God, God. It's not nominal knowledge we're talking about now. This has to be serious. Did Jesus really know who he was? Isn't that a good question? And there are scholars who say, no, he found it out late in life. Yeah? Well, I don't know when. Yeah? I'm afraid I can't take a lot of this scholarship seriously. But anyway, he needs some sort of a serious understanding. Whenever, let's not even specify when, but if he didn't know who he was, he really was BSing an awful lot of the time. Yeah? And from the talk associated with him in the New Testament, it would seem that this chap was relatively confident. Yeah? And, and I say to you, it was said of old, and I say to you, and I will send another. And I and my father are one, and we will send another. Huh? Fits very much into St. Thomas's the, the, the final thing I didn't put in in the line in history was that, yes, the incarnation of the second person, so that the word is present in a, a new way, second person, you have the, the listener, and the later stage of meaning, there is an openness towards the speaker. The speaker is absent from history. Uh, as I say, these are only leads. You have then somehow a dominance of charity moving towards faith, towards an explicit life in hope. And then it, it locates this time as a messy time, a fragmented time, a patriarchal time. Uh, and an orientation towards a future uh, and perhaps a type of religiousness which is much more globally open, the one we've been talking about in the previous session. Okay, so did Jesus have any clue about this? About us? About himself? It would seem that he had. How serious has the understanding to be? Okay, now, this all is worth a lot of thinking, but let's just take it that you have such a thing as infinite understanding. God is infinite understanding. 
Now, how much understanding would this person have to have in order to understand who this person is? If this person is God, then for this person to know that this person is God, this person would have to understand God. It seems terribly simple, doesn't it? Well, say, say we modified it and say, well, well no, no, let's say not the whole of it, but sort of the half of it. <laughs> but you can't have a half of an infinite idea. The point I'm making is that either Jesus understood who he was, or he hadn't, and, and I use the phrase deliberately, he hadn't a bloody clue. And what is reported of Jesus and associated with his presence is not a clueless chap who was living in the darkness of faith. Whoever this guy is, they're more than a prophet. So, again, I'm just spelling out Thomas's view. Jesus understood within his human intelligence the divinity sufficiently to understand history. That's a heck of a reach, isn't it? And again, you have to work from your own life. How you might understand, say, a family of children. If you're in Ireland, you know, I met a man last night, and he was one of 22 children. Trying to understand all the details. Count them at night. Have I got them all here? Uh, and that infinite understanding was part of the understanding, okay, within this what level of Jesus, and it was not got this way. And it, 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 it didn't stop Jesus getting understanding this way. This infinite understanding didn't give the feel of breaking wood carrying water. Jesus grew in wisdom, understanding, began to see things differently, smell the smells, learn the language, the turns of phrase. A wink is as good as a nod to a blind Arab, a Jew, or whatever. Uh, so there's growth in understanding. Uh, this understanding is a strange understanding that can dominate a vision project, but not mesh. And, and there's a slow discovery in the bones of Jesus that, yeah, here I am. And there's wonder and excitement and delight and friendship and the discomfort of the crucifixion. And he can pray on the crucifix in the words of the psalm. Not because there was a forsaken. Uh, I'm just raising questions. And the infinite understanding of Jesus that g gave him the knowledge of himself and of history seems to be a presupposition of the pews, if I might put it that way. The, the, the people in the pews actually assume Can you imagine the people in the church and somebody leaning over a pew praying and, and turning to the neighbor and saying, would you shut up for a minute? I want to get a word in. Uh, th there's an assumption that uh, th this very mysterious chap, hombre, uh, is actually attentive. St. Paul talks about uh, he loved me and gave himself up for me. It's an assumption within the ordinary Christian tradition that somehow this person was quite remarkably beyond the notions that dominate other religions, the Buddha and so on. This is not a view in the other high religions. So it's a little hint at what Thomas thought of the mind, first the mind of God, then the mind of Christ, that yes, it was like to ours in all things, 
except that there was this vision, this project, so that within the mind of Christ, you have at its sublimest what we were talking about earlier, a vision of the speaker, the word, and the listener, and a vision of the project in history, and a vision of that slow project, and a remarkable tension of loneliness in that that can't be talked out. And we're back to this question of inner word and outer word. Please tell it to me plainly, it can't. Where can you get analogies for that? If you think, for instance, of, say, how you might long for a, a baby to really hear the Mozart you're playing, or to see the paintings you, you, you bring the two-year-old around the gallery, well, at least you, you're inviting them. It's an initial calling. You're opening them to a vision. But there's the impossibility of really getting them into this inner word, the real appreciation of literature, music, whatever. So, so you have this enormously remote, weird guy who I think probably didn't get on with his mother because his mother didn't have this vision. There's a way of, of plaster casting the New Testament so that it's all very nice. But this was a weird little kid <laughs> and with enormous inner tensions. Was this, was this a very neurotic chap? There's an enormous amount of work to be done on this on the basis of the scriptures, of the tradition, but also on the, best, on the basis of the best of psychology. And it can't be done unless we tackle this question of what is a mind in the first place. Does that make some sense? Now, we didn't get, <laughs> we didn't get beyond 1277. The condemnation more or less cut off this work from the tradition. This, this is an unread work. I mentioned Carl Jung, and I can mention others who bypassed it. There's a long tradition of Thomists. I think of John of St. Thomas, terribly obscure stuff. But also you have a tradition coming up out of Scotus, died in 1308. The next guy is Ockham, I think died in 1347. And you can follow up a tradition of very empty nominalism, yeah? bypassing of mind, terminalism, a flow of words that eventually gets through to, say, the century before Luther. And you have Gabriel Biel, the nominalist theologian. Johannes Dopitz was the director of Luther. And you find a rejection of this nominalism, as well as the other things we talked about. And you find a revival of Thomism in the last century through an accident of Leo happened to have a teacher who was enthusiastic. Until in the early century, we get to, as I say, we're celebrating the anniversary of the conception of Bernard Lonergan in 1904, uh, who settled out to find out what was Aristotle and Thomas talking about. And the central challenge was and is for us talking about the human mind and the invitation of our superficial half credit is to tackle that problem personally and at least to name the elements of our minds and everybody else's mind and the mind of Jesus but it's not something we'll finish in the next two weeks the spring 